Hello, and welcome to Don't Ignore the Elephant, the podcast where we talk about the stuff that no one else will, the elephant in the room. I'm Liz O'Riordan. I'm a breast cancer surgeon with breast cancer, and during my career, I've had a lot of elephants to deal with. I've learned that talking about them, getting them out in the open, can help you know that you're not alone. Whether it's cancer or other illnesses, mental health issues, sexual problems, bullying, harassment, or the death of a loved one, there are loads of things that can be hard to discuss. I know how powerful it can be to hear someone else talk honestly about their own problems. Some of my guests have lived these experiences, whilst others have dedicated their lives to helping those who have. I'm going to be chatting to them about it and asking the questions everyone else is too afraid to ask. In this episode, we'll be talking about debt, finances, and how to take back control of your bank account and your future. Money. For many of us, it's the ultimate taboo. We're too scared to look at our own bank balance, let alone talk about it with our partner. I never really knew how to budget when I went to university. All I cared about was getting through each week without a thought for my future. Credit cards became my best friend as I bought a house and started working as a surgeon. And although money is an issue that can affect all of us, women are statistically more likely to bear the burden of lower pay and poor financial management. And here's the thing. When we ignore how much we're spending, it can lead to huge problems down the line. And it's not just when someone loses their job or gets divorced. Without a pension or a retirement plan, life could get pretty uncomfortable in the years ahead. So how do we tackle this elephant head on? Enter Davinia Tomlinson. She's the founder of Raincheck, an organisation promoting financial inclusion for women. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Welcome, Davinia, to the podcast. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Can we start with telling us a bit more about you, um, how you got into your career and why you want to help women manage their finances? Yeah. So really, I mean, I started my career within the investment management world almost two decades ago now. And I remember coming straight out of university, moving to London from Birmingham. um, And I was super excited to be joining this graduate scheme at one of the world's largest asset management firms. I was one of 10 graduates who joined that year, of which there were three women. Gosh. And yeah. And as you can imagine, you know, that picture was borne out across not just that organization, you know, certainly the more senior you became um, within the industry, the more male it became. And, you know, when you look across other measures of diversity, you know, it, it was it was an even more bleak picture. Yeah. But the one thing that I would say, you know, in terms of the, the investment management world in the industry is that as much as, you know, there is a lot of spotlight on it and there's a lot of focus around how they can promote this sense of inclusion in general, one of the things that I think really struck me was quite how quickly I took to it as a career path. You know, I I was very clear in my own mind that it was absolutely where I wanted to be and where I thought I could make the most impact in terms of not just, you know, how much I could learn because I'm somebody that, you know, is really always trying to learn new things. I'm very Mm. curious about the world. And finance was one of those, those areas that I thought, you know, wow, the possibilities are limitless. And I could see even at that very early stage as somebody that had, you know, zero knowledge really, very minimal knowledge about the industry and its inner workings. I could see its potential in terms of its ability to help people achieve the things that they wanted to achieve in their lives and and, and affect that kind of transformational change. So I was very much hooked very early in my career. I wouldn't have had the vocabulary or or the range really to, to have thought, hmm, you know, there's a giant gender diversity issue within the investment management world. That wouldn't have been something that I would have thought, but definitely as somebody that comes from a very matriarchal family and, and culture, you know, Caribbean culture is very female dominated. And, you know, within my family, you know, I've got a huge cast of aunties, grandparents, mm-hmm. and, you know, my mom, my sister, you know, lots of women supporting, cheering me on, um, championing me in the same way as the men were, but certainly the women were playing a very significant role there. I couldn't really understand why women didn't have the seat at the table that I was used to seeing growing up. That's really interesting. So that was where that, you know, that was first kind of planted. And then, you know, later on in my career, as I started to see see more things, you know, look more more broadly across the industry, be invited to, to industry events, 
and get an insight into the, how other organizations were working and realize this is not a challenge that's unique to this organization that I work for. Yeah. This is an industry-wide problem. And it's actually representative of what's happening in society at large. You know, women are not being given access to the right kinds of products and services. And more importantly, we're not being invited to be part of the conversation. So, you know, as soon as I was able to do so, you know, running my own business was something that I think was an ambition that I'd harbored for a really long time. And as soon as I had the opportunity to do so, it was a real no brainer for me. You know, I didn't have to agonize about, you know, what am I gonna do when I leave the corporate world? It was quite clear in my own mind, I wanna work in finance, but I wanna do something that is going to affect the change that I think we need to see in order for people to feel that sense of inclusion and to improve their overall quality of life. And so, you know, focusing on women was something that came very naturally to me in that sense. And can you tell us a bit more about RainCheck and what it is that you offer women now? Yeah, so RainCheck, my original mission was to just get more women to invest because that was really where I saw, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this over the course of this conversation, but from my perspective, you know, working in an industry where we were managing trillions of dollars of assets on behalf of investors worldwide. And this is on behalf of the industry mm. as a whole, you know, that these these were the numbers that we're looking at. And when you looked at the proportion managed on behalf of female investors was negligible. And I thought, gosh, that there's something very wrong with this. And so my big impetus was how can we get more women to invest? Very simply, and I was really clear on that mission and objective. Yeah. And so it started from a place of financial education, because I recognized, okay, one of the biggest stumbling blocks we have is not so much that women lack confidence. You know, I I feel sometimes a bit twitchy about, you know, these broad brush terms that are used to target women, particularly as somebody that is surrounded by some really powerful, ambitious, you know, very accomplished and talented women who don't lack confidence at all in any aspect of their lives. When it comes to the conversation of money, either they feel that it's something that for whatever reason, they don't have the same level of knowledge about it. And of course, how you know how that manifests itself is in you kind of censoring yourself from the conversation, or maybe you're not yeah. invited to, to, you know, into those conversations, exactly as I said about having a seat at the table. And so on that basis, you find yourself mute almost. So in the beginning, you know, what I wanted to do was to share, you know, in really bite-sized chunks, bits of information about, you know, to demystify the world of finance and investing, unravel some of the awful jargon that the industry is renowned for and help people to just feel comfortable with some of these terms that on balance might seem technical, but which given that they impact us all and and impact how we live our lives should be, you know, at the fingertips of everyone, whether you are a man or a woman. Yeah. So when I look back through magazines that you read in the teens and the twenties, there was never any talk about money or investing. It always seemed to be the thing that the man did. Definitely. And I'm somebody that was, you know, an avid magazine reader myself. So I feel like I've got an encyclopedic knowledge of all of the magazines that might have been available in the 90s, targeting young young girls and teenagers. And you are yeah. absolutely right. And actually, you know, it's disappointing to note that that really didn't change, you know, as my, my magazine habits evolved and became more sophisticated. You know, in the early 2000s, when you looked at some of the, the other, you know, adult glossies, they weren't much yeah. better. And, you know, there's a whole raft of research, you know, Starling Bank in particular did some great research. They have a campaign called Make Money Equal, in which they mm-hmm. did some analysis on the publications that might be targeting men versus women and the language that's used. And, you know, it was quite stark to see the contrast in that, you know, anything that was targeting men was talking about, you know, building portfolios, real estate investing, stock market investing, cryptocurrencies and what have you. And the publications targeting women were focusing on how you could save money on your grocery shopping or, you know, maybe maybe do a bit of cash saving. But it was certainly much more focused on consumerism, how you could save money on purchasing and and consumption. Yeah. Or spend the money on the shoes and the handbags, but don't think about your future. Exactly. And so because I know my audience, you know, I'm very clear in my own mind about who I'm talking to with Raincheck. And I think, you know, it's women that are very similar to me, that women who are well-educated, have a good grasp of their careers, they know where they're going, they know what they're doing, or even if they don't, you know, they're putting themselves in a position to do that. And so I didn't think, you know, I didn't feel that I needed to dumb anything down or to patronize them. Instead, what I wanted to do was to say, look, this is what you need to know. These are the conversations that we haven't been party to in the past. But actually, what we need to do now is to come together and to share ideas, share information, share some of the concerns and misgivings that we might have, and one by one to dispel them. So that was the first plank of the service. 
The second plank was thinking, okay, I can look at, you know, having worked in the industry and knowing that financial advice is quite often the differentiator for lots of people in making really savvy strategic money management decisions. And again, financial advice is an area where you, you start to see these gaps springing up where, you know, women are having poorer outcomes than men, perhaps because they're not getting access to financial advice or they feel that doors are being closed in their faces. Now, of course, it would be unfair to suggest that this is happening, you know, across the board universally, but certainly anecdotally and based on the research that I did before setting up RainCheck, there were lots mm. of women who said that they just weren't having the experience that they wanted to have. I mean, you consider that there are so many of us that are much happier talking about our sex lives than our finances. It's such an exactly. intimate area. You know, we, we're, know. So, we're so happy to talk about anything at all except what we're spending. You really yep. want to make sure that the chemistry is right. And so exactly. I thought these are the two areas where there are some very obvious challenges that need to be resolved. And so if I can fix you know, the ability for women to get access to just really sound, no frills, financial knowledge and education, as well as yeah. really good quality, qualified and regulated financial advice. And I always stress that because I'm like, there are a lot of people running around on social media and everywhere else um, oh, purporting God, yeah. to offer, you know, uh, professional, <laughs> me. Ex- ex- it's awful, awful. Yeah. And I'm sure you must see it as well with, you know, purported medical professionals peddling oh, advice. And- how do you know who to trust? It's like, who's got the flashiest account on Instagram? Yeah, exactly. really bad. And so what I wanted, again, was to be a face that women who needed support, so it, you know, it was always intended to be, this is not something that is going to be done to you. You have to be part of it. You have to be someone that's open to having that conversation. And that together, what we are going to do is work together to achieve your financial goals, which ultimately underpin your life goals. And the financial advice will be a conduit to, to facilitating that. Yeah. So refreshing to hear that. And actually, women get dumbed down by so many people in the media. They assume we don't understand things when Mm -hmm. we do. And actually, interestingly, the day we're recording is Equal Pay Day. Yes. And I saw you tweeting about that. Can you explain what it means and why it's so important to make this an issue? Yeah, no, thank you for highlighting that. Sadly, so today is the 18th of November, 2021. There's Equal Pay Day in the UK, which means from today until the end of the year, women will work for free because of the gender pay gap. Wow. And <laughs> wow. It is brutal. For UN women, for example, they they produce a whole body of research regularly that talks about, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic, that talks about the contribution women make to global GDP, which runs into the trillions of dollars mm. in unpaid labor, unpaid social care. And if women yeah. were paid for their efforts, I mean, we'd be billionaires. We We'd would, at least we? be millionaires. So the idea that we'll be working for even a day for free is obscene. And you just, you know, you think it's in a really perverse way. It's like women are kind of the gift that keeps on giving, but with no, you know, there's no upside for us at all. Yeah. We're just giving and giving and getting nothing back. And do you think it's partly, to be controversial, is it our fault because we're not good at asking for raises or knowing our value and our worth, whereas traditionally men are very good at asking for promotions and women don't like doing that? Yeah, no, I love this question. I mean, I love anything that's a bit controversial anyway, but um, I think the thing that I always try to separate is what are the things that we can control and what are the things that are outside our control? So when you think about the gender pay gap and and where it, you know, where it came from, its origins... Of course, you know, these things start to become, you know, institutionally enshrined based on, you know, workplace policies and opportunities for women, the advancement of women in the workplace and the conditions, you know, are organisations creating workplace cultures that are conducive to the working patterns that suit women better? And and this is not Mm. at all to suggest that organisations should be looking to, to be contorting themselves to suit all of these different ways that people might want to work. But I think it's just a recognition that actually, in order for you to get the best out of your people, whoever they are, it really needs to be an environment in which they feel that they can thrive and they can be their best and most authentic selves. And for lots of women, they don't feel that they're able to do that. They feel that they might be, um, if not shouted down, but at least, you know, frowned upon for speaking up or, you know, maybe opportunities are not being given to them in the way that they see those opportunities being given to their male counterparts. So there are definitely things that need to be done at a structural and kind of institutional level for organizations to look across the board at what's happening. I think that said, 
definitely, you know, there is a role to be played by personal responsibility in all of this, even when we look at the outcomes for women from a financial perspective. So certainly when we're looking at the gender pay gap, of course, as I say, there are things that organisations need to do and they need to shoulder the vast majority of the responsibility, I would suggest. But exactly as you've outlined, I think sometimes that what we can do, and this might be as a result of societal conditioning, it might be as a result of Mm. things that we've inherited from our upbringing, you know, those sorts of limiting beliefs. I know that the term imposter syndrome is bandied about, but I mean, ultimately, it's a bit of a general term for all of these different psychological beliefs and mindsets that we might have that are impeding us from achieving our, our full potential. And so what we do see, you know, even anecdotally, all of us will have experience of, you know, a real overachieving woman, a a female colleague, someone who, if you look back, you know, through her childhood into her teen years, probably did really well at school, was a straight A student, Mm. flew through university, starts work, is very conscientious, very diligent, does really well in her appraisals. But does she speak up for herself? Does she self-advocate? You know, is she someone that pushes herself forward for opportunities? And as much as, you know, there are, as we said, as I've outlined, companies and, you know, heads of department, et cetera, need to think about how they can promote that inclusion, not just for women, but for everyone. But I think Mm. that when it comes to our career or anything that's really important to us, we have to take responsibility for it. And we really have to make sure that if we want something, that we speak up and we're willing to go after it irrespective of what we think other people might be thinking of us. And I think that that's one of the ways that sometimes women can potentially hold themselves back. And I say that not to be harsh and not to be critical, but I do think that it's important that we're able to have really open, honest conversations with one another so that we can see everybody win. We can see everybody succeed. So for example, if we are negotiating for a new job and we, you know, we get the new job and we're so excited, we're over the moon to have got that opportunity. And at the point at which we have an opportunity to negotiate our salary, even if we think we've been made a really good offer. But actually, when we look outside that organization, we look at uh, our peer group and what's being paid elsewhere in the market, we need to be making sure that we are maximizing our earnings as much as we possibly can, because we know that there might be a certain point in the future where our earnings might be impeded. And we want to make sure that we're maximizing it as much as we possibly can for later life. So there are lots of examples like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. How can we get people to be more open and honest about money and how much we earn and how much we're spending? I mean, it's a great question. And I think there has to be this kind of almost a consensus that we form where we say this is not necessarily about, you know, about our individual enrichment. It's about making Mm. sure that we can all succeed, which I think sometimes, you know, and this is a bit anthropological, but just looking at, you know, how Western cultures evolve and how we've developed We are very individualistic in the way that we live and work quite often. And as a result, it means that even if we don't on the face of it feel that we're competing with one another, we definitely worry about judgment. We worry that someone else is looking at us and and frowning upon us. Well, why is she earning that? You know, maybe she's earning too much or maybe that person's earning too little. I thought they would have been earning way more than that. And I think that fear prevents us from having these open conversations. So I think The first step is to just have one conversation. I think, you know, with anything, the thing that I always tell the rainmakers is that your path to achieving your financial goals will start with one micro step. Just take the first baby step. Yeah. If we're having these very intimate conversations about our love lives and and everything else, just have one conversation with a really good friend. And then it might be, you might be in a, a group. And I think it's really important that we start to open up these conversations and just even on an individual basis, just one-to-one say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, maybe broach the subject tentatively and then you can open it up and you will be amazed how willing people are to talk and how refreshing and enlightening it can be once you have that initial conversation. But one thing that I just wanted to, to highlight here is that is that I never want women to think that, you know, there are certain things for women and there are certain things for men. But actually, you know, I've got a really good group of friends from university. We've been friends for mm-hmm. over 20 years now. And, you know, we all kind of went through the very traditional path, got married and um, some of us got divorced, had children and what have you. And all the men set up an investment club and all of the women set up a book club. And it just became, you know, you know, you think of the kind of traditional mother's meeting. So we kind of have our 
book club meeting and the men would be discussing the real topics they would go off and you know you know and they would go for drinks and they would have their own and they'd be talking about investment planning and and you know angel investing and stock market investing and they built thriving investment funds and of course as the as women we all benefit from that in a very peripheral way but in terms of our own financial agency it's completely lost why can't you join the party right i think that's a really important point to highlight it's just, oh, how do we take back that control? I mean, it, it's not easy, but I think it's kind of t- pausing and taking the time to reflect on our whole lives and to say, what is it that I really want to achieve? I think there are certain points for lots of us as women, like even for anyone listening to this podcast, if you were to pause and say, looking at where you are today versus where you thought you might be, you know, when you were, you yeah. know, you were a bit more idealistic when we're teenagers and young people, for example, and, you know, what's the gap? Is there a gap? You know, are you very closely aligned with where you thought you might be, in which case, brilliant. Yeah. And how fulfilled do you feel where you are? Is there more scope for you to grow? And are you clear on what you need to do to grow? It's a very kind of personal, private kind of, you know, almost like a journaling exercise where you just jot down all your thoughts in a really free flowing way, get it all down on paper, just purge your mind of everything. And then just, just get clear with yourself, get really honest with yourself about am I achieving the things that I want to achieve? Or have I been so focused on goal attainment that I have lost focus on the things that spark joy in my life? And then use that as the anchor, use that as the North Star to guide you back to what you might like to do. And it doesn't mean you abandon your whole life because you're now in pursuit of joy and happiness and, you know, at the expense of everything else. Not like that would be a bad thing, but, you know, certainly just thinking, what is it that I really want to do? And am I, you know, living life to the full? And if not, what are the things that I might like to do to achieve that? And then just reaching out and plugging those gaps in our expertise. I mean, one of the things that I always say is great about the Rainmaker community is that this is a group of really diverse women. And it's very interesting because of its global nature. It's interesting to see the parallels in terms of, you know, the excruciating nature of some of the money conversations. At the end of the program, at the end of their time, you know, working together, working with one another, we all feel that we have a much better grounding of our financial futures, what we might we might want to do next, but also what happiness means for us. So we're not looking at what other people's lifestyles are, as you can easily become yeah. sucked into on social media, but just what it is that we want to do and what financial infrastructure we need to put in place to achieve that. I'm so yeah. inspired by those women because I think it's such an, a funny thing, isn't it? Joining a financial coaching program with other women. It just okay. sounds like a really yeah. weird thing to do, but it does. It, it's so enriching because it's not. we're not talking about money. We are talking about yeah. money as a tool. And I think that's the distinction that makes the difference. To stop comparing yourself to others and just live your life. Yeah. Let's go on to some more practical stuff. Why is it important to save for the future? And when should we start? Yeah, so I come from a household in which my mum was obsessed with pensions. So for my very first job oh. um, out of university, I was 21 or 22, the first thing my mom said to me, she didn't even care what the salary was. She was like, well, what's the pension? And are you in really? the pension scheme? Honestly. And I just, and I was like, oh gosh, mom, it's so boring. And I'm like, yes, I'm in the pension. And I think therein lies the problem, isn't it? You know, pensions have got a bit of an image problem. Immediately you hear that yeah. word. It just conjures up an elderly, typically woman. So, it, you know, it conjures up this, this, this idea of the elderly. And when you're in your twenties, you're thinking, yeah, I'll think about that in 10 years. Like, I don't need to think about that now. And of course, in 10 years time, all sorts of other life has happened. And you're thinking, oh gosh, well now, if you hadn't been putting money into your pension in your 20s, suddenly you may be earning more and the percentage contribution you might make at that point will seem far greater. So I think, you know, just just reflecting on my mom's advice and sorry to to be my mother, but I think as early as you possibly can, as early as you possibly can, from as early as you have your first paycheck, you know, in your first full-time job, and of course, there are certain thresholds. There is pensions auto enrollment in this country. So that the option is really taken away from you unless you opt out. I would always advise people not to opt out. We hear all the time about this idea of free money, which I think sometimes can be a bit of a misnomer. But ultimately, you're mm. incentivized by the government to save for later life, mainly because they want to reduce dependency on the state. They don't want to have to finance you in your later life. And I think, you know, we really need to reflect on the quality of life, the lifestyle we might want to have when we are pensioners. So, And we're all living longer now, aren't we? We are all living longer. Women, I think, since time began, have lived longer than men. You know, there is a lot of data that shows, despite us living longer than men, we're saving significantly less for later life. There are a number of different drivers for that. And so it's really important that as women, 
especially, we do take the time to focus on what we can do as early as we possibly can to mitigate that impact that we might absorb in later life. So what we don't want is to, to you know, sleepwalk into pension or poverty. So start where you, wherever you are, do what you can. But I would say in your 20s is the best place to begin. And if you haven't begun at that point, don't panic. Of course, we can't get back time. But what we can do is change what we do tomorrow and every day thereafter. Yeah. That's great advice, Davinia. Now, I want to come on to something else. I was an incredibly gullible 20-year-old junior doctor, and we'd have financial advisors come into the hospital and flog us life insurance and critical illness insurance, and I signed up for everything because I was so terrified of not being able to pay the bills. Mm. No, I was lucky. I was this close to cancelling my critical illness insurance when I got breast cancer, and I did get a large payout, but... Before then, I wasn't sure whether it was worth it because you see all this money go out every month. Is it worth spending money on things like life insurance, illness insurance, or is it just a waste of time? Oh, Liz, that's a great question. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing, you know, your experience and, and how you were able to benefit. I think, again, and the protection industry, as it's known, I mean, protection sounds so awful, doesn't it? Mm. It makes you think of kind of, I don't know, like MI5 or something. Um, God, yes. Or... <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately... What you are trying to do is to protect yourself and your loved ones from financial harm in future, should mm. anything happen. And I think because it's it's quite a morbid thing, isn't it? It's, it's part of the reason why so few of us, you know, will proactively sort out a will, because you don't want to think about the, the idea that you might not be there. We're invincible. Exactly. But it's the one thing that's going to happen to all of us, isn't it? We are all going right? to die. Exactly. But yeah, it's, it, again, it's a conversation that is so taboo. We don't want to talk about death for obvious reasons. So... I think that one of the big challenges with the protection industry as a subset of finance as a whole is that because people aren't clear on what it is that they're buying and like lots of different areas within the financial services industry, it's driven by fear. You know, they're tapping into people's emotions and, and the fact that yeah. maybe they don't understand. And that's one of the things that I was, you know, I'm desperately trying to make my contribution to tackling because I think it's so important that for something as fundamental and vital to everybody's lives as finance, it really is important that people are familiar with what they're putting their money into. And so, Liz, I guess in response to your question then, absolutely, but I think there is a time and a place for when different types of insurance might be appropriate. So, for example, one of the most obvious pinch points for lots of people is you might be, you know, when you're responsible for children you might be responsible yeah. for other dependents they may not be your children there might be others they might be younger siblings or anybody that you might be responsible for for whom you want to make sure if something happened to you imminently there would be some financial protection for them and I think that might yeah. be you know one of the first things it's an easy thing for us to get our heads around you might have a house and you might therefore want to make sure that if you were ill you know you were ill but you didn't die that you were able to at least keep a roof over your head and maintain those mortgage payments. So that might be another obvious pinch point at which you might think, okay, I'd, I'd quite like some cover around this. And it's so important that we just have the right kind of advice. So rather than us, you know, rushing into buying the first thing that we see, because sometimes, you know, again, I see lots of adverts saying, you know, get protection at six pounds a month. It yeah. really is important that we're clear on what that provides and that we don't just sign up to something that in the event that we did need to get access to it, we find that actually we're not covered for, for whatever reason yeah. or it's not the right kind of product. Kind of take the emotion out of it. Just take Absolutely. the emotion out and just think clearly. Definitely. So the next thing I want to talk about is debt. And I had my fair share of it as a junior doctor because suddenly I was paying thousands of pounds for exams and courses and you start dressing and eating and drinking the way that you think you should because you have a new lifestyle. And I know when I first started dating my husband it was really hard to own up and say I've got credit card debts what do you mean you don't have any and it's so easy now with tap and go and buy now options like Klarna we don't really realize how much we're spending and it's so easy to become overdrawn have you got any advice just to help us stop this happening yeah definitely and actually your experience is very similar to mine I mean if you imagine you know I'd move from Birmingham to London and I was so excited mm. by all the bright lights and all of the designer clothes and shoes and everything and you're working in you know one of the <laughs> wealthiest industries yes. and all I could think was wow I want to be like these glamorous women you know these mm -hmm. powerful women and you know I, I grew up on this diet of working girl and the big shoulder pads and all the glamour and oh. blitz of and so yeah. I very quickly 
very similar to you, you know, got a credit card and, you know, they were flinging credit cards at people at that time, you know, on 0% balance transfer. And I was just transferring balances from one card to another. Every six months. Yeah. Never really thinking about paying off the balance. And so I think the thing for me is that it's really important, particularly given how easy it is to access credit lines, exactly as you say, we've got you know, this burgeoning buy now, pay later industry. I say burgeoning, it's actually massive. It's more of an explosion of this buy now, pay later it's industry. It's ridiculous, isn't it? That I guess, you know, for lots of us, if you think back to previous generations, sometimes I do think we're at risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in some ways, because we think, you know, everything that's new is better and everything that's old is, you know, prehistoric. When actually some of the principles we might have heard from our grandparents, for example, about cut your cloth according to your size or, yes. um, you know, don't spend any more than you've got. So if you if you yep. actually haven't got the cash available, that means you can't afford it and you just wait. So we've lost that ability, you know, you know, from a deferred gratification perspective, we just want everything immediately. And it's borne out. In, and we can in, get it instantly now, can't we? Definitely everything, absolutely everything. And so we've seen this kind of mass consumerism growing. And so I think the thing that I always talk about is, and we saw it quite a lot during the pandemic as well, this idea of emotional spending, because we were confined to our homes, we're on social media, scrolling and scrolling endlessly. And we see these idyllic yep. looking lies with the loungewear and the beautiful throws and cushions and all of this, all of this stuff. I think it's important that we, we get back to basics and start thinking about wants versus needs. But that's no fun. I that's know boring. it's boring, boring. <laughs> However, One of the things that I always talk about, you know, with the Rainmakers is, you know, thinking about because budgeting, like lots of these different financial principles of good money management, like getting a pension and what what have you, really boring. No one wants to think about budgeting. It just sounds like a life of privation when actually having a budget is one of the most liberating things you can do because effectively what you're doing. Yeah. If you think about what you're doing, you're basically saying, right, every pound has its place in my life. And so Mm -hmm. when I get my income... I'm clear on where that money is going. I'm not, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that frivolity is a bad thing, but you don't want to live a life where, you know, your money is in control of you and you're constantly chasing around going, oh, did I spend that? Had no idea. Money's just flying out of my account. I don't know what's happening. Am I in the red or not? Don't know. The level of anxiety that's generated as a result of that financial chaos is probably much more significant than we would ever, you know, imagine. And I'm sure Liz, you better than I would be able to to articulate the the medical, the physiological implications of stress on our bodies as a result of financial distress. And so one of the best things you can do for your well-being is making sure you're staying on top of your money. You've got a good system for tracking where your money is going, tracking your cash flow. There are lots of apps that facilitate that. And then making sure you're carving out, just having big buckets. So you've got a proportion of your money that's set aside for your needs, you know, your grocery bills, your mortgage, your rent, utilities and what have you. Boring, but necessary. And then a portion of your money that's set aside for your wants. What are the things that really spark joy in your life? What are the things that make you happy, lift your spirits? You know, anything that you enjoy doing. And then making sure you've got a portion set aside for savings and investments. So you've got all of those three main categories covered and they'll be covered to different degrees, different proportions. But if you've got those main bases covered, then at least you can sleep easily at night knowing, you know what, actually, it's not really the most exciting part of my existence setting this up. But if you have something in place, it's not like you're going to have to spend a lot of time on it every single month or every single week. You automate it and you are just having to keep track. And I think that's one of the best ways to make sure when we think about debt and think about ultimately what we're doing. And of course, I'm not suggesting that everybody's in debt because they are trying to live or keep up with the Joneses. Absolutely not. There are people that, for you know, unfortunately aren't earning enough to uh, maintain a basic subsistence level lifestyle and of course there are a number of services that can support people in kind of you know with debt counseling and helping them to manage Mm. helping them with payment plans and I I absolutely am a massive advocate and champion of those services but for those people where you're actually earning a really decent salary and the challenge is much more of a practical one around you've got more choice you've got options on then yeah. definitely, I think for those people, we really need to just be exercising more mindful spending and not depriving yeah. ourselves, definitely making space in our budget for the things we enjoy to do, but just not being out of control of our money. I think that's that's the thing that I would say with debt as, as a whole. It sounds very easy to do, but often it's so hard to stick to it, to remember. What do you do when you get those impulses, think, oh, there's a handbag I really need or a holiday that I can't quite afford, but I deserve it? I know. Oh my gosh. And the idea of deserving. I think that there is something about one of the, the, the innovations that I love most with fintechs. If you think about financial technology and all of these apps yeah. there are that are out there, 
The thing that I love most is that they are offering convenience, what they are selling. And of course, in exchange for data, you know, of course, they get access to your spending habits and patterns and, and what you're doing. But the benefit to us is that it helps us to automate our entire lives. We can automate, you know, where money is going. It helps us to set up different pots in our account. So we will generally know the things that we like doing. So the, the idea that you might want a holiday, as much as it might be an impulse to say, you know, I fancy going to Mauritius instead of going to Santorini, for example. I'm coming with you. <laughs> right. So let's say, you know, you, you have an impulse to, on the location. But you definitely will be somebody that's probably in the past demonstrated an interest in travel. So that's probably something yep. that you love doing. You know that it's going to boost you up and, and make you feel good about yourself. You can set up a pot for that so that you are putting money aside so that at the point at which you have that impulse, you can say, OK, well, I've got the money already there in my travel pot. So I'm going to spend the money in my yep. travel pot completely guiltlessly because I know that when love I get that. back from holiday, I'll replenish it. And I think that's really important, isn't it? You know, using the tools yeah. that are available to us to help us automate and manage our money really effectively. That's such a great idea. Now, here's a question I've often struggled with. When you are in debt, should you save as well? Mm, great question. Because you hear saving for the future, pensions, all of that, but then you've got credit card bills to pay off. Should you do both at the same time or? I think yes. However, there is a caveat with it. So I think anything that's pension focused, I would always say, even if it's a minimal amount, make sure that you are yep. still putting money into your pension. The reason for that is lots of these things are habit. They're based on habit. So ultimately we want mm -hmm. to just have established the habit of knowing that money's coming out of our account and going to the pension and that we're not missing it. And so that when we get to a point of having paid off the debt, when you, you, you know, you might decide, okay, all the money I was previously paying into the debt, I'm now going to put on the pension and I'm still not going to miss it. Because if you haven't established yeah. that habit already and you're, you're focused on paying off the debt, what happens is when you start, when you stop paying off that debt, you're mm -hmm. over the moon, you're elated. Are you immediately going to think, okay, now I'm going to have this other, this new millstone around my neck, with, which is a pension. I've just freed myself from one millstone. I want a bit of a break. That makes sense. And the next yeah. thing you know, you've got, you've taken a long break and 10 years have gone by and you've, you haven't bothered to pay into your pension. So I think in that respect, it really is important that you do the two things simultaneously. That said, if you were planning to save for something that was maybe more of a short term goal and actually you're racking up a really high rate of interest on that debt, because, of course, compounding works in reverse as much as it's a benefit to us when we invest. Yeah. When it comes to our debt, it's working in reverse. So it's really accelerating, you know, the cost of that debt. And, you know, particularly so that, yeah, now that Mauritius holiday on the credit card. Yeah, oh, my gosh. APR. Just awful. <laughs> And so I think if you're thinking about, you know, it, it, should I should I put the, the Mauritius holiday on the, the credit card or, you know, should I invest? I think it's really important that you say, let me galvanize all of my financial resources and put them all together to try and pay off that credit card quickly because it's costing me a fortune. Once I've done that yeah. really quickly, now I can focus on some of my other short term savings objectives. But when you're thinking about really long term investments and, and your pension is ultimately the longest investment many of us will have, we're talking about a 30 year horizon for yeah. most people. I would always make sure that you start the habit as early as you possibly can, even if you do already have debt. So future first. Definitely. How can we teach our children about being better at money than we are? I'm acutely aware of this now because I have two daughters and I also, I always think to myself, you know, I don't want them to be like the cobbler's children. So no. while I go out and, and talk to everybody about money and particularly having Especially girls. Especially in the future, we don't really use money anymore. Exactly. It's all tap and go. So they don't almost know the value of money and will we actually have physical money in the future? Yes. And that's a really great point that you highlight, Liz, because this is a conversation that I've had to have with the girls because they, it's rare that they will see mommy with cash in her purse. Mm. So, you know, I remember there was a time, particularly during lockdown, when I would take them for little walks and, you know, we'd go into shops and there was one time they you know, we were walking somewhere and they wanted an ice cream and I went into the shop mm -hmm. And I didn't have enough cash on me. And of course, that you know, a corner yeah. shop is not going to take a card for like an ice cream. Nope. So I'd said, I was like, oh, sorry, girls, we're going to have to go home and, and do something else. We'll have to have a yogurt or something instead. And my eldest daughter, who at the time was six, was like, well, mommy, why can't you just tap on? <laughs> and it really made me laugh because I was like, oh, my gosh, I was, I mean, I'm kind of laughing. But at the same time, I'm really horrified that she has no idea of how money actually works. Or yeah. because the fact that I didn't have any money in my purse, I was then able to explain actually I could tap on this shop doesn't allow me to tap on but it's really important that you know when we run out of money it means that maybe we haven't managed our money properly and so we've run out of money and plan to buy something and now we can't buy it or it means we've just run out of money and therefore we have to make different choices we have to make different decisions on the basis of that 
And I could see her brain kind of ticking over and thinking, wow, there's a world in which you might run out of money. I think that's a really mean, important principle yeah. for them to grasp. Because I guess the tap on nearly always works. You'll just go over into an overdraft and really hard to know. Exactly. Have I got the money there to buy this? Yes. So in the same way as, you know, with Rain Check, I'm trying to open up the conversation with women. I mean, we, we form our earliest money habits and behaviors at the age of seven. Cambridge University did a wow. study on this, honestly. And I've got a seven-year-old and I remember just think, being really chilled by that. I was like, wow. But then, you know, as individuals, you know, when I you cast my mind back to being seven, I remember my sister being born at that age. And mm -hmm. I've got very vivid memories of that time. So it kind of makes sense. So if you grow up in a household in which maybe there's a lot of arguing and stress and tension about money, or you grow up in a household in which, you know, maybe you're having conversations about money around the dining room table, that will have a bearing on, you know, your money behaviors in future. And it doesn't mean that they are kind of set in stone and you can't change them, but it just means that there are lots of entrenched beliefs that you will then have to overcome. Yeah. So I think that having those conversations, if you can be closer to the scenario of the family in which you are sitting around the dining room table and at the same time as you're asking questions about, you know, how was your day at school or how was work and, and whatever else, that you're exposing children to not necessarily all of the adult conversations, but it, just exposing them to conversations about money. So it's normalized. It's not something to shy away from or to worry about yeah. raising. Maybe giving them an allowance when they get to a certain age and helping them to establish a way of tracking and managing that allowance, giving them some responsibility in the home so that, and, and maybe if you want to do so, I know that there are different schools of thought on this. You know, you don't want to pay children for chores. I understand that. But actually, if you can give them some responsibility and help them to recognize that you can earn money and the value of yeah. your earned money will be greater than the value of any money that someone can just give you because it means that you have put in your time and effort. Exactly. And as the, off the back of that, you're going to treat it far better than you would do if you were just gifted money. So I yeah. think all of these principles are really important. But just remembering that in the same ways we wouldn't want to patronize one another, we, we shouldn't be patronizing children. We need to treat them as kind of tiny adults, miniature adults, and recognize that they are going to grow into adults who you would want to be able to live really financially stable lives. That's great advice. Thank you so much. I guess just finally to ask, do you have three tips that would really help our listeners manage money? If there were three things they should do to either spend or save or budget on just to take away from all of this. Yeah, definitely. I think budgeting you know just mm -hmm. a, you know from a very basic perspective and it doesn't have to be oh now we've got to whip out a spreadsheet there are a number of different <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of different apps that you can use that you know you can link your current account to I know some people are a bit funny about that but there are lots of reputable providers out there and just use one of those fintech apps just to if you if you're not already doing that just to familiarize yourself with your own spending patterns you'll be amazed at how much data you will be able to glean about yourself mm -hmm. and maybe certainly there might be certain points in each month when you might be triggered by different things things or you know you, you see these patterns forming really useful thing to do so that you can start to get a good grasp of what's happening with your money within your household the second thing I would say is have conversations with whoever is in your household about money if it's not something that you're doing currently you know try and put it on the agenda try and open up that conversation so it's not a taboo making sure that you're aligned on conversations of money you know money is one of the biggest sources of friction within relationships so if you can have really healthy conversations then that's one of the ways to really promote that sense of harmony that I'm sure we all strive for in our love lives and then finally, don't be afraid to, you know, explore options to make our money work as hard for us as we have to work to earn it in the first place. And by that, I mean, there are lots of women, again, data show that women are very diligent savers. You know, we open mm. ISAs each year at a much more rapid rate than men do. And it's not wow. a competition. It's not a competition. No. but it's, it's just important to kind of highlight that there is nothing wrong with women's competence or conscientiousness when it comes to saving money but I think where we run into difficulty in terms of particularly you know against this backdrop of the pay gap so we've got an even greater imperative to make the money that we do earn work even harder for us we need to be clear and be confident and grounded in the reality that stock market investing over the long term so we're talking over an 18 year period for example yeah has a much greater probability of outperforming cash savings you're going to get much 
more for your money, much better bang for buck than if you put it in a fixed rate deposit account. And if you know, I mean, obviously we're in a low rate interest environment now. We have been for a number of years. But even when those interest yeah. rates go up, it's unlikely that those rates are ever passed on to savers. They're certainly passed on to borrowers, but savers are always at the bottom of the priority list. So it's really important that we think about rather than opening up a cash ISA in every tax year, that we instead start to think about, you know, maybe I want to dip my toe in the water of a stocks and shares ISA, use the yeah. knowledge and information that's out there that's available to you. And again, use some of those fintech apps to guide you through the process. You're not having to think, where should I invest my money? What should I be doing? They are designed to help provide those decision trees to help simplify and streamline the process. So please do take advantage of them. That's great advice. I guess we all just need to get educated so we can empower ourselves. Absolutely. One more question before we go. I've heard you talk a lot in the last hour or so about sparking joy, and it's something that really resonates with me. When my cancer came back after my chemo, I was in a really bad place. And so to make myself happy, I started a jar of joy. And it's just an old goldfish bowl. And every time something good would happen, I'd write it on a card and put it in a joy. Put it in a jar even, sorry. <laughs> and I've, done, I've started one for the podcast. And I ask all my guests to tell me something that's given them joy in the last few days. I can add it to the jar. Oh, What would wow. you put in our jar? Oh, that's lovely, Liz. Such a lovely idea. So... In the last 24 hours, I was invited onto BBC to provide commentary on the latest rise in inflation. So inflation has risen to its highest rate in a decade. And mm -hmm. whilst that is a bit of a gloomy story, I, it was an opportunity that I almost turned down. I almost said no to it because really? of my own, yeah. And it's amazing. You know, I was having this conversation with the Rainmakers and saying, I had to remember all of you and remember my girls and channel my inner Rainmaker and say, Dav, you tell women all the time to remember their, you know, how good they are and, you know, to remember yeah. that, you know, they can go out and do anything. There's no way you can say no to this. So you've got to say no. yes and you've got to just, I mean, it's a basically a sink or swim opportunity and it was brilliant. It went really well and I felt really proud. So that is something definitely that's given me joy. There are people that that's have sent fantastic. me such lovely comments and as much as it's important that we're able to cheerlead ourselves, it really is nice to receive that kind of feedback from others too. So I would yeah. love to put to that in you're your making jar. a difference. That yeah. is going in the jar. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Davinia. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Can you tell us how our listeners can find out more about you? Yes. So we're active across social media, but in particular on Instagram. So just follow Raincheck, Rain CHQ. And if you'd like to find out more about the services we offer, then you can visit www.raincheck.com. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Don't Ignore the Elephant. I wish I'd been able to speak to Davinia when I was younger. So many problems would have been avoided. Her key message is to communicate, not only with yourself, about your hopes, dreams, and what you're actually spending your money on, but with your partner and your friends as well. Let's make talking about money become a normal part of our lives. I'd love to know if Davinia has spurred you on to start budgeting, investing, or saving for the future. I'll put a list of useful apps in the show notes for you to go and explore. The feedback from last week's episode with Clara has been amazing, and I've lost track of the number of people who we've inspired to start exercising regularly. Lisa started lifting using water bottles and was thrilled to have made a start. Lynn said it was a delight to realize that the perfect body doesn't exist and she can now stop criticizing herself. And Helen said she listened on her morning run and loved the idea about your body simply being a vessel for your soul. She saw her body as her partner as she went through treatment and she praised it as she got better. And I love the sound of that. Keep me posted on your exercise progress. On another note, the jar of joy has been inundated with entries this week. Sarah ran with her friends in the freezing cold dressed as Santa. Karen had her family join her on a long pre-chemotherapy walk. And walking was definitely the theme of the week as Catriona had a sunny walk in the park with her daft spaniels. And finally, Janet said having her five-year-old granddaughter coming for a sleepover and packing her own bag. I love an independent woman. Next week is the final episode of season one and I've got a very special guest, the author and broadcaster Jane Garvey. We're going to be talking about divorce, self-deprecation and whether life begins again at 50. Make sure you tune in. And if you listen on iTunes and have a few seconds spare in your day, could you leave a review and let me know what you thought? It helps other people find us so I can help them start talking about their elephants in the room. Thank you for listening. 
Don't Ignore the Elephant is produced by Birdline Media in association with Elizabeth Richards. 